Morning. Green, green means go, orange means it's not going to go. Very good. Um, well, what a pleasure to be with you this morning. Um, is not Central Australia at its absolute best in April and August every single year? I hope you've been enjoying it. Uh, lots of water in this story, spoiler alert. Lots of water around Central Australia right now. Fantastic. Um, anyone here love a good spoiler? Who, who, who just thanks the spoiler when they spoil that movie or that show or that series? You've watched 20 episodes and you go around maybe sometimes for up to 48 hours doing your best to not come into contact with anyone who would spoil what's going to happen. My, uh, my father, he actually doesn't mind a bit of a spoiler when it comes to watching the cats. Geelong fans, hands up now. You're in good company, very good. I don't understand why there's not more. <laughs> but my father actually relaxes and enjoys the game more when he already knows the result. So yes, he misses out on the excitement of not knowing the result, but he feels like he can just enjoy the game more. In fact, some games he'll watch the second time so that he can enjoy it the second time. That's how intense he can be sometimes watching the footy. Anyway, long story short, we've got this absolute epic story today. And as we continue to work through Exodus, but spoiler alert, like most of you will know that they make it. So... What are we doing here? We know how the story goes. You know, there's this ethic story, really, in Exodus of how God takes this nation of slaves, 600,000 odd men plus women and children, and powerfully leads and guides and delivers them out of slavery into a land flowing with milk and honey over 400 kilometres away. In the midst of what is going on with the Israelites as a nation, God is also wanting to do a work in their hearts. And a significant part of this is God showing and demonstrating who he is to them in a special way. So where we are in the story today in Exodus 14... The Israelites are in a precarious and life-threatening circumstance. They are trapped. They've escaped Egypt, almost. They've been let go, but now Pharaoh has changed his mind. And now there's an Egyptian army pursuing them and a Red Sea stopping them from running away. Why is the Red Sea a problem? It's a problem not because it is flooding and it's not chasing anyone. It is just an impenetrable body of water for a nation with no boats. Like even you and I, as Aussies, if we were faced with the Red Sea, would not be backing ourselves in to swim across it and survive. The best of the best of us would, but most of us, in particular children, would drown. So the Red Sea is on one side. Why is the Egyptian army a threat? Well, it's a bit like bees. Bees in a swarm aren't a threat until they're attacking and chasing you. They can be swarming over here. They can be flying past you in a swarm. As soon as the swarm turns on you, there's a major problem. And the Egyptian army is in the area, not for military training, not for border surveillance, but because they are coming to capture or kill the Israelites. Preferably capture. Because as we see in the story, Pharaoh's just realised that they've got this massive labour force that is 
empire building for Egypt that all of a sudden has just walked out of their rule, out from underneath their rule. So, if we know what happens, if the story is spoiled because we've already read it and know that they survive, why continue? We continue because it's not just about what has happened, it's why. It's not just about what God has done, but why God has done it. And so hopefully this story connects with your story this morning as God speaks to each one. So let's take a read. Now, next bit of technology, I'm going to see if I know how to... I can. Very good. All right. So, then the Lord said to Moses... Tell the Israelites to turn back and encamp near pi between Migdol and the sea. They are to encamp by the sea, directly opposite baal Zephon. Pharaoh will think, the Israelites are wandering around the land in confusion, hemmed in by the desert. I'll harden Pharaoh's heart and he will pursue them. But I will gain glory for myself through Pharaoh and all his army. And the Egyptians will know that I am the Lord. So the Israelites did this. When the king of Egypt was told that the people had fled, Pharaoh and his officials changed their minds about them and said, what have we done? We have let the Israelites go and have lost their services. So he had his chariot made ready and took his army with him. He took 600 of the best chariots along with all the other chariots of Egypt with officers over all of them. The Lord hardened the heart of Pharaoh, king of Egypt, so that he pursued the Israelites who were marching out boldly. The Egyptians, all Pharaoh's horses and chariots, horsemen and troops, pursued the Israelites and overtook them as they camped by the sea near pi Haharoth, opposite baal Zephon. As Pharaoh approached, the Israelites looked up and there were the Egyptians marching after them. They were terrified and cried out to the Lord. They said to Moses, Was it because there were no graves in Egypt that you brought us to the desert to die? What have you done to us by bringing us out of Egypt? Didn't we say to you in Egypt, Leave us alone. Let us serve the Egyptians. It would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than to die in the desert. When I read that last little uh, verse 11, uh, I wonder what tone goes through your mind. I wish I was an actor sometimes. You have a lot of fun with it, I think. But... It's obvious there's some mild panic, and understandably so, going through the camp of Israel at this point in the story. Easy to say to those Israelites in hindsight, don't worry, be happy, God is with you. Don't you know he splits the sea in half? It's all good. Try and put yourself in that moment. Life was hard in Egypt, but right now it is so bad that you would rather be in Egypt than be what they thought was facing certain death. And sometimes as an adult you can handle the idea that you might be put in harm's way. But you've also got your children, your nephews, your elderly parents, anyone that you ever cared about, or what it would seem about to suffer the same fate. Israel at this point is not the Israel under the rule of David with great armies and knowing how to go to battle and do all those amazing things that happen later on in the Old Testament. This is 
Israel, fresh out of slavery, all they know how to do at this point is walk (laughs) and work in Egypt. They didn't have trained soldiers. They didn't have chariots. As we said before, swimming long distances is not a thing that they could have done. Deep water was a scary and cursed thing in many ancient cultures. Even the fishermen in Jesus' day, they fished the shallows because they were scared of the deep water. Their situation to any normal person looked dire. And everything going on for the Israelites is new. And you might have experienced this in your own life. When you've been a slave to something, whether a way of thinking or a pattern of behaviour or a habit, and you break free of it, and you find yourself in new territory. It's unfamiliar. It's scary for a while. The Israelites were well trained in slavery, not well trained in freedom. And you would have heard it said, but I'll say it again in case you haven't heard it. That it was days to get the Israelites out of Egypt, but it was 40 years to get Egypt out of the Israelites. God has protected them up to this point, but they haven't gone far in their journey and it's looking like it's going to come to an end. God has said repeatedly through Moses, he's reminded them, you are my people. I am your God. This was demonstrated during the plagues, but they never would have felt as vulnerable as they did right now. In Ecclesiastes 1 verse 9, it talks about there being nothing new under the sun. Talk about a spoiler. (laughs) It says, what has been will be again. What has been done will be done again. And yet, our lives seem to be full of discovery and having to discover so much for ourselves for the first time. And so, think about this for a moment. God, this is the God of the Israelites here who's saying, you are my people and I am your God. If God is always good, if he's always loving, if he's always kind, if he's always full of grace and mercy, if he is a deliverer, a protector and a healer, Hearing that and agreeing with that is one thing, but discovering that for ourselves for the first time is a whole other thing. Where we go from God, I know and I've heard it said of you that you are wise and you're good and you're loving to God is always good to me. He is always loving to me. He's all of, always full of grace and mercy towards me. God is my protector, my deliverer, my healer. And the Israelites are on that journey of discovery right now in this story. And you and I, whether it's been hours, days or years, are on that journey of discovery too where God is showing us who he is in your circumstance, in our circumstance. where God is saying to us personally, but also as the body of Christ today, you are my people. I am your God. So cool. And so this gap between knowing in our heads and experientially knowing is just a journey of discovery.
we get to discover these things for ourselves. Let's move on in the story. Moses answered the people, Don't be afraid. Stand firm and you'll see the deliverance the Lord will bring you today. The Egyptians you see today, you'll never see again. The Lord will fight for you. You need only be still. Have you ever been in a situation that's a bit dangerous and the best thing to do is just to be still? Or, and it's the best thing, but also the hardest thing? Uh, it's only about a month ago. Um, a uh, brown snake came right through our camp at two mile. And uh, almost no one saw it, but Amias saw it, if you know Amias. And there it was. It's great, because it was at night time. And um, the best thing to do is to be still. And uh, sometimes people don't want to be still. They want to jump up on chairs or run away or move around. Well, this is a bit different. But Moses saying, you need only be still. This reminds me a bit of Daniel in the lion's den. Reminds me of Jesus and his disciples when the storm came in the boat. Also reminds me of Jesus' conversation with the criminal who received mercy and grace in the final hour of his life. Be still. Examples of where God meets us and acts in the midst of us being still. When we've got no other hope but God. Stillness in this case is not being paralysed by fear. It is an expression of active obedience. For that time that God asks us to be still. It's not passive. It looks passive. But for the Israelites, it would have taken more courage to be still than to run like headless chooks, so to speak. Stillness. Maybe for some of us this morning, God's asking us to be still and let him fight the battle that we have no strength or wisdom or power to fight for ourselves. Then the Lord said to Moses, Why are you crying out to me? Tell the Israelites to move on. Raise your staff and stretch out your hand over the sea to divide the water so the Israelites can go through the sea on dry ground. I'll harden the hearts of the Egyptians so they will go in after them. I'll gain glory through Pharaoh and all his army, through his chariots and his horsemen. The Egyptians will know that I am the Lord when I gain glory through Pharaoh, his chariots and his horsemen. This is pretty incredible. Then the angel of God, who had been travelling in front of Israel's army, withdrew and went behind them. The pillar of cloud also moved from in front and stood behind them, coming between the armies of Egypt and Israel. Throughout the night, the cloud brought darkness to the one side and light to the other, so neither, neither went near the other all night long. Now, I know the focus of the story is on the parting of the Red Sea, and that is pretty amazing, but can you also imagine witnessing this? <laughs> oh, it's pretty incredible, isn't it? This is God in just such a powerful way saying, uh, absolutely no way these Egyptians are getting anywhere near my people. In fact, to make sure we will... Uh, have the angel of the Lord go to the rear of the Israelites and this cloud also to separate them so they cannot see or make contact with one another. Throughout the night. So this is the other interesting thing, is that we can read this story in about a minute, but for the Israelites this possibly was the longest, one of the longest nights of their lives. And then Moses stretched out his hand over the sea all that night. All that night, the Lord drove the sea back with a strong east wind and turned it into dry land. The waters were divided. God in this moment is 
inviting the Israelites to discover through their lived experience that he is their protector. That he is their deliverer. That he is the God who makes a way when there seems to be no way. That he is the good shepherd. It was God who commanded the Israelites to camp in this location. But God didn't command them to camp there so they could be destroyed. God commanded them to camp there so that he could deliver them and demonstrate again powerfully who he is and who he was. Sometimes we can get so preoccupied with getting from one thing to the next that we forget that in God's big picture is a desire to make his presence and power known in all circumstances. There's a cultural assumption that life should most of the time be happy and good and secure and prosperous and stress-free and you just add the list. Scroll through your Facebook feed or Instagram or whatever and you just add all the posts up and that's the message that our culture today is teaching us that that's what life is about. Here we've got a story of a nation that God loves and has called this people his own and yet he commanded them into what from a worldly point of view seemed like a very dangerous place, a very unsecure place, a very uncertain circumstance. Now for God, of course, he knew what he was going to do. He wasn't stressed out. He wasn't worried. He... You know, his own love and goodness, the, the integrity of his character meant that God wasn't worried. But for the Israelites who are human, just like you and me, it's uh, helpful, I think, for us to factor into our lives that hard, difficult, uncertain, Unideal, <laughs> awkward circumstances are a part of life. It's a part of the experience of being human. And there is something so special about those circumstances because God meets us in those circumstances and reveals himself to us in those circumstances in a way that he cannot reveal himself to you when everything is happy and prosperous and stress-free and insulated and all, you know, etc., etc. Now, we should be very thankful for the seasons of our life when it is happy and prosperous, connected, full of friends, family, whatever. But given that we are guaranteed to have seasons where life frankly sucks, where all we want to do is get out. The invitation of God is that before you rush out of that circumstance under your own strength or retreat from that circumstance under your own strength and wisdom, let me meet you and show you who I am. Because I am the living God. I am not. Jesus, you know, this is, I'm paraphrasing here. It's God going to say to you and I, I am the living God who is alive and well and able to meet you where you are at and show you that I am a protector, that I am a deliverer, that I am a healer, that I am good and wise and loving all of the time. Let me show that in your life. That's, that's the heart, the father heart of God to you and I. And it's so easy to miss that invitation of God to discover more of who he is in the circumstance that frankly sucks. Sometimes it can be so helpful to think about the role that God is playing. If you're a visual person, is he holding you? Just think about your life right now. Is he holding you? Maybe he's not holding you. Maybe you're on his lap. 
Maybe he's leading you by the hand. Or maybe he's calling you from a distance. Maybe he's looking at you with a beaming smile. Or just looking on you with eyes of love. Maybe he's just holding space for you to vent and grieve and be angry. Maybe he is defending you. Let's not forget to notice and discover who God is revealing himself to be in the midst of difficult circumstances. There is always an invitation to discover personally more of who God is. In Luke 14, 15 to 24, there's this parable of the Great Supper and this man puts on this banquet and gets his servant to invite all these friends and people that are known to him, but they're too busy, too preoccupied. And so very quickly the servant comes back, gives this report, and the master says, well, that's fine. If they're all too busy, go anywhere and everywhere you can and invite anyone who is available to come because this banquet, in other words, the grace of God is going to be poured out. There's too much to contain. It's got to be poured out somewhere. And so if the busy and the rich are too busy and rich to come to this banquet of grace, then invite anyone and everyone. That's the gist of the parable in Luke 14. When you think of what's going on in your life right now, where there's uncertainty or a risk to safety and security or where you're vulnerable or hurting or anxious, who is God in your situation? How is he at work? Because the invitation to find out is ever-present, ever-present. God would want to say, you're still my child and I'm still your God. So the invitation could be to trust. That's the same as the invitation the Israelites received in this story, to trust. Could be an invitation to grow in love, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, self-control. Could be an invitation to give, an invitation to see God move and act, an invitation to surrender. An invitation to become more like Jesus. An invitation to be grateful. An invitation to love. An invitation to truly live. I, I don't wish grief or chaos on my life or anyone that I care about's life, but there is an, there is an element of truth to the fact that without those dark experiences, you haven't fully lived. And God wants and is more than able to be God in those circumstances as well. If we move on, we know this happened, but let's uh, see what happened. Anyway, the Israelites went through the sea on dry ground with a wall of water on the right and the left. To the Israelites' credit, this would have taken a lot of faith because it's like we're terrified of the Egyptians, but we're, quite, we're just as terrified of water, but it seems to be a wall of it on either side and we can pass through, so let's do the thing that we're the least scared to do. And um, they do it, to their credit. At this point, I do want to say, if you're here this morning and you've never said yes to Jesus' invitation of grace, of welcome into the kingdom, of forgiveness for all the mistakes that you've ever made, let God, your creator and the lover of your soul, breathe life 
back into yours this morning by his spirit. Jesus died and was risen again so that anyone who puts their trust in him can truly live now and for eternity. The enemy of the Israelites was the Egyptians and the immovable barrier was the Red Sea. Well, the the enemy of every one of us is the darkness around us and the darkness within us, expressed as sin, caused by our own pride, wanting to be our own little G-God. Our sin leading to death is the enemy that we all need to be delivered from. The immovable barrier is this thin veil called death. We're all approaching it. And God has made a way through it. In John 14, 6, Jesus declares, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to God except through me. Well, God is present in the world today by his spirit, and God is very present (laughs) in the world to come, or the world that currently is in heaven, uh, which we will see after this veil called death. It's a thin veil. It's not an impenetrable wall. It's a thin veil, but it's a veil that none of us are going to survive through without Jesus. Then the Lord said to Moses, stretch out your hand over the sea so that the waters may flow back over the Egyptians and their chariots and horsemen. Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and at daybreak the sea went back to its place. The Egyptians were fleeing toward it. The Lord swept them into the sea. The water flowed back and covered the chariots and horsemen, the entire army of Pharaoh that had followed the Israelites into the sea. Not one of them survived. But the Israelites went through the sea on dry ground with a wall of water on their right and on their left. That day the Lord saved Israel from the hands of the Egyptians and Israel saw the Egyptians lying dead on the shore. And when the Israelites saw the mighty hand of the Lord displayed against the Egyptians, the people feared the Lord and put their trust in him and in Moses, his servant. Here's a people who, for at least 24 hours, is panicking and looking to their own resources, to work out how they're going to get out of this one. And after God has shown himself to be faithful again, shown himself to be protector and deliverer, it says the people feared the Lord and put their trust in him. They took a step closer to knowing, but knowing, but knowing that they are his people and he is their God. We have a God who longs for us to know him more. If you just close our eyes as I close, pray in just a sec. God, through his work on the cross, and Jesus and Jesus' resurrection, the giving of his spirit, there is a river of grace constantly flowing. We have a God who wants to be present in every circumstance. We have a God who has an invitation constantly to each of us, wherever we find ourselves, to discover more of who he is. Just in this moment, allow God to bring fresh awareness of your current circumstances. Often so much going on, you can't focus on it all, but just allow God to bring something to mind that's going on for you right now. He sees you. He loves you. There is a river of grace flowing from the throne of God. He is inviting you this morning to take off your shoes and walk into the river. Place yourself in his grace.
sometimes you find yourself in a place where it feels impossible to walk into that river. But God sees you and he loves you. In your helplessness, that river of grace is breaking its banks and finding a way to flow to where you are. God wants to heal and protect and deliver. He wants to show himself to you, to you, to you, to you, himself loving, good and wise. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, you are the same yesterday, today and forever and it is incredible what you did in bringing the Israelites out of slavery. Lord, we're so thankful for the record of your enduring love and faithfulness and power displayed at a national level. But God, we thank you that in you not changing and you being the same yesterday, today and forever, there's something in your heart and in your mind that wants us to discover who you are in our circumstance. You see it all. You love us so much. In this moment, Lord, we take our attention off our own resources and logic and working things out. Lord, there's a place for all of that. Lord, there's a part that we have to play. But in this moment, God, reveal yourself to each and every one and remind us who you are and who we are in you. In Jesus' name, amen.